Galatians 3 is a challenging chapter for our Hebrew Roots friends. In a previous video, which I'll link to below, we examined a teaching by Steve from Torah family, which really missed the mark. But it's not enough to expose where Torahism's interpretation of Galatians 3 goes wrong. It's also important to spend time studying this chapter for ourselves to learn what it does teach, because it's pretty amazing. So today, we're going to do a straight-up Bible study on Galatians chapter 3. So grab a cup of coffee and, and your Bible, and let's dig into this. Let's start with a quick bit of background for context. This book is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and the second verse of the letter addresses it to the churches in Galatia. Now, in Paul's day, the term Galatians was used both ethnically and politically or geographically, right? There's actually a North Galatians theory and a South Galatian theory, but that's not terribly important for our purposes other than it leaves some ambiguity regarding a date and, and the intended audience. But the key problem addressed in this letter is that after Paul and maybe Barnabas had planted new churches in Galatia, false teachers started coming in after them who were teaching that the works of the law of Moses were required in order for believers to be justified. And these are the, the Judaizers, or in modern times we call them Hebrew roots. And Paul was writing this letter to correct their false teachings and set the record straight for the believers in Galatia. And in chapters 3 and 4, Paul's focused on the relationship between the law and the gospel. And that's where we're going to jump in. Okay, as you know, the chapters and verses aren't actually part of Paul's letter. They were added centuries later to help readers locate verses and ideas. So we're going to start our study of Galatians 3 with the final two verses of chapter 2, which lead us right into chapter 3. And I'll be reading out of the ESV translation. This comes at the end of a passage where Paul's been talking about being justified by faith. So starting at chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And with that statement about righteousness coming through Christ, not the law, Paul turns his spotlight on the churches of Galatia. Chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So Paul's kind of telling them to snap out of the spell or shake off these bewitching teachings. And this is the first of what will be a number of statements in this chapter that contrast the law with faith. Paul loves to ask these rhetorical questions. Verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? There's that contrast again. If you believers in Galatia came to faith by the Spirit, why are you now seeking perfection by the flesh, or as he put it in verse 2, by works of the law? Picking up at verse 4, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies... <laughs> these questions just keep coming. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? or by hearing with faith. Again, law is being contrasted with faith. Verse 6, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So Paul's introducing an idea that he's going to flesh out in the coming verses. He points his readers to Genesis 15, where God made a covenant with Abraham. And Paul's going to lean on Genesis 15 quite a bit as he makes his case here in Galatians 3. So, as a refresher, remember that Abraham and his wife Sarah had grown impatient waiting on the Lord to give them a son, so they took matters into their own hands. And, and, and at 86 years old, Abraham had a son, Ishmael, through his servant Hagar. And Genesis 15 is where God tells Abraham that it's not Ishmael who's going to be his heir, that he will have a natural son. 
And despite doubting God earlier, Abraham believed him. Genesis 15:5. And he, God, brought him, Abraham, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was considered righteous based on his faith. And so here in Galatians 3, Paul's reminding his readers that the sons of Abraham, the heirs of God's promise, will ultimately come through Abraham's faith in God. Picking up uh, at verse 7, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. And that's a quote from Genesis 12, 3. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So Paul is directly linking Abraham to Jesus here. He actually says that the gospel was preached to Abraham, which brings to mind the words of Jesus in John 8, 56, where he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And here in Galatians 3, 8, Paul quotes Genesis 12, 3, where God told Abraham, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So Paul's saying, and he'll lay it out even more clearly as we go on, that God's promise to Abraham is fulfilled in those who have faith in Christ, which is amazing. So if you're a Christian today and you place your faith in Jesus, then you are an inheritor, a living heir of the promise that Yahweh made to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Verse 9 says, Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham. Wow. Okay, with that foundation established, Paul now introduces his next point. So starting at verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So Paul's using Deuteronomy 27, 26 and 28, 58 to show that everyone who relies on works of the law is under the curse of the law. He's contrasting that with the blessing of Abraham that's given to all who trust God, including Gentiles, as he mentioned specifically in verse 8. In other words, contrary to what the Judaizers taught, the law can't justify or save anyone. Why? Because the breaking of any commandment of the law brought a curse on the person who broke it. Deuteronomy 11 says, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. And these blessings and curses are spelled out in more detail in Deuteronomy 28. So Paul is telling the Galatians here that since no one can keep the law perfectly, we're all cursed. It, it echoes what Paul wrote in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so Paul continues here in Galatians 3, verse 11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And that's a quote that points us back to Genesis 15.6, which we just looked at, where Abraham's faith is what made him righteous. But that quote is also found more explicitly in Habakkuk 2.4. So as usual, Paul is building his case on the solid foundation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And now he's really going to draw out that distinction between faith and law. Verse 12, But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. And here he's citing Leviticus 18.5 to draw a stark contrast. The law is not of faith. They aren't the same thing. Why? Well, because the law is based on doing and faith is based on trusting. It's Paul's recurring theme here that the law doesn't make us righteous. And for those who want to claim that it takes faith to obey the law, Paul quotes Leviticus here in verse 12 to show that God requires the doing of the law, not merely believing in it. And therein lies the rub. Since no one can keep the law perfectly, we're all cursed. So Paul goes on to say, verse 13, But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. 
so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. He's reiterating how Abraham connects directly to Jesus as well as those who have faith in Jesus, including the Gentiles. So where the law of Moses was only given to Israel, the promise to Abraham has always been intended for both Jews and Gentiles. This is why God told Abraham in Genesis 12:3, "...in you shall all the nations be blessed." And Jesus, Paul is saying here, Jesus is the culmination of that promise. And now Paul offers an illustration to further explain this connection that he's making. Verse 15, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Once an agreement is made, you don't mess with the terms. It's already been agreed to. And Paul is pointing out that the covenant that God made with Abraham is a done deal. It's been ratified by God himself, which we read about in Genesis 15. And God doesn't break his promises. Verse 16, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So the covenant, the promise that God made, was not only to Abraham, but also to Abraham's descendant in the flesh, Jesus. God knew from the moment he made his promise to Abraham that it was going to be Jesus who fulfilled it. And now Paul introduces the law of Moses into this, into this connection. Verse 17, This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So we have God's covenant with Abraham, and then 430 years later, God gave the law through Moses to Israel at Mount Sinai. And Paul is telling his readers that the giving of the law didn't change or nullify the earlier covenant that God had made with Abraham. His promise to bless all the nations through Abraham's faith remains. And Paul, maybe sensing some confusion on the part of his readers, raises a question. Verse 19, why then the law? In other words, if it wasn't for salvation, then why was the law given? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. So why was the law given? Because of transgressions. Well, what does that mean? I think the point Paul's making here is that God gave the law because Israel was disobedient and rebellious and needed guidance. Now, he's going to later compare the Israelites to children who haven't come of age yet and are enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So the law was given to help define sin and provide guidance for God's maturing children. This is reminiscent of Romans 7.7, 7, where Paul writes, If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said, You shall not covet. So, the law doesn't make us sinners, it shows us to be sinners, right? It points out our need for a Savior. And again, since no one can keep the law perfectly, we're all under a curse and we're all in need of a Savior. Which brings us to the second and very significant point that Paul's making here in verse 19. He says, The law was added until the offspring should come. So, what's he talking about here? Well, the offspring to whom the promise had been made is Jesus, of course. Paul just explained that to us in verse 16. And he says that the law was added until Jesus should come. In other words, the law of Moses always had an expiration date. It was a temporary law. It was given until Jesus came, until the Savior arrived, who would redeem us from the curse of the law. Now, the law of Moses, as Paul writes in Romans 7.12, is holy and righteous and good. But it wasn't given to everyone, and it wasn't intended to last forever. And then Paul adds this enigmatic comment about the law, picking up in verse 19. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary apply, implies more than one, but God is one. So this passage is a bit tough to interpret, but here's how I see it. 
Paul is saying that the law of Moses was given through angels by an intermediary, referring to Moses, right, who, who mediated the Sinai covenant. So with the law of Moses, you have God giving the law through angels to Moses, who then gave it to Israel. So it involved multiple parties. But with Abraham, it was just God, and he made his covenant directly with Abraham, right? No middleman involved. So why would Paul take the time to point this out? Well, I believe he's pointing to the superiority of God's promise to Abraham and saying that, that a temporary law is not greater than a permanent covenant. And the covenant made with Abraham was not only permanent, it was essentially unconditional. There, there were no conditions that needed to be met in order for God to keep his promise to bless all the nations through Abraham. But the blessings of the law, on the other hand, were dependent on Israel's obedience. There were conditions placed on those blessings. That's what we see in Deuteronomy 11 and 28 and elsewhere. If Israel kept the law of Moses, they would be blessed. That's the condition. And in the end, Israel wasn't able to keep it. So with the Abrahamic covenant, we have a permanent promise of complete grace, right? A free gift given by God to Abraham and then through him to all the nations of the earth. Now the law by contrast was temporary and it was kept only through human effort. Paul isn't saying that the law was bad or wrong, but rather that it was temporary and inferior to God's permanent promise to Abraham. And once again, he anticipates his reader's objections. Verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. This is a restatement of what Paul said in the last verse of the previous chapter, Galatians 2.21. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If righteousness or salvation or life could have come through the law of Moses, there would have been no need for Yeshua's sacrifice. And although the law can't give life, it doesn't contradict God's covenant promise to Abraham. The law serves a different, and we might even say a complementary purpose. And in the next verse, Paul explains that that purpose included making us aware of our need for deliverance from sin. He writes, verse 22, But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus might be given to those who believe. This is really cool. Paul's showing how God's law, the scripture, and God's grace, the gospel of Jesus, work together to bring lost people to salvation. So the law imprisoned everything under sin. It made it obvious to everyone that we are, in ourselves, sinful and not in a right relationship with God. As James describes it in James 1, the law is like a mirror that helps us see our dirty faces, right? And through God's grace, by faith in Jesus, we find forgiveness and we're cleansed of our sin. And then moving on to the final paragraph of this chapter, Paul's going to use an illustration that would have meant something a little different to his first century readers than it does to us today. Now, the Greek word Paul uses in this closing paragraph is pedagogos, which literally means a child conductor, a conductor of children. It's the origin of our more modern word, pedagogue, which refers to a teacher. So some translations will use the English word schoolmaster or tutor in this section. But I think the ESV's use of the word guardian is actually closer to the mark. So in Paul's day, many Greek and Roman households had these well-educated slaves who acted almost as surrogate parents. They would watch over the children and sometimes teach them and, and even discipline them. So they were protectors as much as teachers. And this is what Paul has in mind when he uses the word pedagogos. Verse 23. Now before faith came, and, and he's referring to faith in Jesus, as he just mentioned in the previous verse. So he's using the word faith here as a metonymy, as, as shorthand for Jesus. Before faith, Jesus came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith, Jesus, would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian, our, our pedagogos, our teacher and protector, until Christ came. And, and here Paul reiterates the temporary nature of the law. So in verse 17, he says the law was given until the offspring should come. And he repeats that idea here. The law was our guardian until Christ came. So the law of Moses was temporary. It, it was a set of rules specific to Israel that was given to guide them and protect them like a pedagogos until Jesus arrived. 
And why was Jesus sent? Picking up in verse 24, in order that we might be justified by faith, we're justified, we're made right before God by faith in Jesus, not by the law. There's that theme again, verse 25. But now that faith, Jesus, has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under the pedagogos of the law. This is such a brilliant passage. And Wearsby points out in his Bible exposition commentary that by using this illustration of a tutor or a pedagogos, Paul's pointing out how the Israelites were brought up by the law, they were raised and taught by the law, but they weren't born through it because the pedagogos is a, is a protector and teacher of the child, but it's not their parent. It's not where the child came from. This is a fabulous metaphor for what Paul's been talking about in this chapter, that the law didn't give life to Israel like a, like a parent gives life to their child. Rather, the law regulated their lives like a, like a tutor or a protector. Paul's really targeting the Judaizers here, and he completely dismantles the theology of Torahism, which is the modern-day Judaizers who teach that followers of Jesus are required to keep the law of Moses, and not doing so is sinful. And Paul demolishes that theology in this chapter. And there's an even more significant aspect to this metaphor because it includes this aspect of maturity. So a guardian or a pedagogos was never intended to watch over the child forever, right? They were an important but temporary guide because once the child comes of age, he doesn't need a guardian anymore. Not because the guardian was wrong and bad and had to be done away with, it's because the child has become mature and the pedagogos has successfully completed his duty. In other words, the law of Moses was a guardian and a preparation for the nation of Israel until the coming of Jesus. And once he came, God's people no longer needed that guardian. Not because the law was wrong or bad or had to be done away with, it's because God's people had come of age and the law of Moses had successfully served its purpose. This was God's plan all along. And then this chapter ends with Paul unpacking what all this means for followers of Jesus. What does it mean that God's people have now come of age, like, like a child who's reached maturity? What does it mean that we're no longer under a guardian? Let's read verse 26 to the end. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Wow. Paul's painting a beautiful picture of unity in Christ here. We're all children of God through faith, as many as were baptized into Christ. We're all equally part of God's family. Now, Paul obviously doesn't mean here that there's literally no more Jewish or Gentile ethnicity, any more than he's suggesting there's literally no more men or women, right? He's saying that in terms of salvation, in terms of those who have come to a saving faith in Christ, we're all part of the same family. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean to be part of God's family? Verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So Paul's reiterating the connection between God's promise to Abraham and its fulfillment in Jesus and its effect on believers. Every one of us today, Gentiles and Jews alike, who have come to faith in Jesus, are living inheritors of the promise that God made to Abraham. And, and while the law of Moses was only given to Israel, the promise to Abraham was always intended for all believers, both Jews and Gentiles. Genesis 12, 3, In you shall all the nations be blessed. And Jesus is the culmination of that promise. Now, that brings us to the end of chapter 3, but as I mentioned, there were no chapter numbers in Paul's letter. And the point he's making here actually continues on into the first few verses of, of what we call chapter 4. So let's finish this out. Chapter 3 ended with Paul teaching that all who claim faith in Jesus are heirs of God's promise to Abraham. And now he expounds on that idea by introducing a contrast between a son and a slave. Chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So Paul's returning to the metaphor of maturity and, and the pedagogos. So when you're a child, 
Although you're legally considered an heir to the whole estate, in many ways you're no different than a slave. You still have to obey your guardians until you come of age. And this, of course, is a metaphor for God's family. Verse 3, In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now the phrase, when we were children in this metaphor, refers to Israel before the coming of Jesus, God's family in its early days, the Israelites. And Paul says that we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. In other words, for both an underage child and a slave, there are no decision-making rights or freedom, and you don't own anything, right? I like how Wearsby puts it. Paul states that the Jews were, like little children, in bondage to the elements of the world. This word elements means the basic principles, the ABCs. For some 15 centuries, Israel had been in kindergarten and grade school, learning their spiritual ABCs so that they would be ready when Christ would come. Then they would get the full revelation, for Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He encompasses all of the alphabet of God's revelation to man. He is God's last word. Okay, so verse 3 we were children enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. And then here comes that hopeful connecting word that tells us that something has changed. Verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, and in case we hadn't made the connection yet, this phrase is where Paul openly explains that his metaphor of coming of age was referring to the arrival of Jesus. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under a law, Oh man, this is such a theologically dense statement. Paul's packed a ton of truth into this one clause. So he's teaching that Jesus was divine, the Son of God, and that he was also human, born of a woman, which fulfills the promise that God made way back in the Garden of Eden. After the first sin, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking of Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Theologians refer to this verse as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. It introduces two elements that are foundational to Christianity, the curse on mankind because of Adam's sin and God's plan to redeem us from that curse through a savior. And Paul also says here in verse four that Jesus was born under the law, meaning he was Jewish and born into the people who lived according to the law of Moses. And as a Jewish man and a descendant of David, Jesus also qualified as the promised Jewish Messiah. So again, verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. And why did God send his Son? Verse 5, To redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So the word redeem here is exagorazo. It's the same word Paul used in chapter 3, verse 13. It, it's a sort of marketplace term, and Paul uses it to mean to set free by paying a price. So, so in Paul's day, you could purchase a slave either to keep the slave for yourself or to set them free. And Paul's teaching that Jesus didn't redeem or purchase us to make us slaves, but rather that we might receive adoption as sons, to make us sons and daughters. So in Paul's analogy, the Israelites were children enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, and with the arrival of Jesus, we've become sons rather than slaves. And if that's the case, then a return to the law would be to turn our backs on the work of Yeshua on the cross and return to slavery. We've graduated from underage children, no different than slaves, to sons and daughters of our heavenly Father and heirs of the promise he made to Abraham. And then verse 6, Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. And the word Abba is an Aramaic term of, of intimacy and closeness. So we're not just sons or daughters, we're beloved children. And then this passage concludes in verse 7, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Amazing. For those of us who claim faith in Jesus, we're sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. And not only that, we're heirs of God's promise to Abraham. God is so good. Baruch Hashem. Thanks for watching. Shalom.